we've already said that processes um, support procurement and uh, th there are certainly areas um, uh, where uh, this would be usable uh, in procurement is indeed used by some people. And Bill mentioned their indirect spend, for example. And I also have a list here of other areas uh, of business, not to do with procurement, but just a, a random list, if you like, where it can also be used. Logistics and distribution. Well, most of us are familiar with the courier, or maybe you send a registered letter, and when you register a letter in the post office, they give you a number, and then you can look on the internet, and you can see where the item is. Or uh, you can purchase things from you know, computer supplies, for example, when you order them, it sends you an email and you get a link, and then it tells you, you know, ready for packing, and has been packed and has been shipped and you know and so on um product development very useful there because products uh in you need interaction with people all over the place and not just people in one place factory production marketing accounting and so on Jishin, uh, i have a question for you yes Just, yes um so Something that uh, occurs to me is uh, based on conversations I've had with uh, procurement executives at conference and and face to face is that one of their common um, complaints with uh, this kind of initiative is that they meet with quite a lot of process resistance that either people within their own departments or especially those who sit outside of the procurement department but nevertheless need to be involved in some kind of process review the uh, the process setting procedure as some kind of inhibition of their talents or a criticism of their abilities in some way and that they they meet with resistance in trying to establish these kinds of processes. Can you um, offer any advice or, or comments on, on how to minimize or overcome that kind of resistance? Yeah, I can. I mean, King, with this in, in our company for uh, two or three years now. And in fact, the process you see on the screen there is a screenshot of one of ours. And um, our experience is, um, most people don't know what you're talking about at the beginning. So um, if you've got, um, shall we say, a team that are using this, um, then it's easy enough to invite one person in. Uh, whereas if you tell people what they should do, nobody knows what you're doing. So my answer, my suggestion would be that you you start your process. If you're doing a process model, you do it in association, uh, for example, with us, <laughs> uh, where we have an up and running team who understand these things. And we invite in the client into a team where there may be three or four other people doing things as well. But together we model the client's processes or a particular, just a single process. And then um, when that's running, then you can progressively invite other people in. Um, so th that's one thing. And another thing is, of course, any cultural change always gets resistance. And if, for example, to do this, you need, um, for example, a logon to a, a computer in a client's location, then somebody is going to say, well, I'm not sure about that. Um, you know, I, I don't think that should happen. And then you get huge resistance. Um, so my answer to your question, uh, Jean-Pierre, is, is twofold. One of them is try to start by involving who are already doing it. It's like, think of a village. You have a village and somebody comes in from somewhere else and, and they they, they sort of integrate, they learn the language or, um, you know, they, they learn what the local habits were. But if you put all the people together at one go and sort of said, well, turn yourselves into a little village, they wouldn't. It would take hundreds of years. So that's the key. And then on the should change, take something that, that doesn't have extra boundaries, for example, sign-ons and log-ons and all that sort of stuff. And that's a nice thing here because it's accessible through the, um, the browser. Um, it seems that uh, I passed a comment earlier about indirect. Um, direct materials are ones that are in the bill of materials and normally require big data and massive processes uh, to to regulate them, to order the materials, to do the forecasts, and link in with production. It seems that a, a more light touch and agile system 
would be far better for, than that for what are called indirects. These are materials that uh, could include consultancy, could include tools, um, office supplies, things that are less critical where the requirements are distributed across an organization and where the processes change more often. It seems to me that the scope for using this type of uh, workflow is immense in this indirect area uh, rather than the direct supply chain area. Would you like to comment? Um, I, in a way, I wouldn't in the sense that um, I'm, my area of expertise is more in how you get workflows to work, and I work with subject matter experts in the area. But I could certainly um, imagine that working with indirects would be a good to start. Um, and it certainly, without question, has benefits. And um, it, it, there's no point in a company saying, well, we're going to suddenly introduce 300 processes across the board or something like that. You have to start somewhere and get a bit of experience. Um, and then when people have got the idea what it's all about, then you can reassess. So I, I think process could be used in these other areas, but they would be more complex ones in the the, the, um, the, the, the type of procurement you were talking about. And of course, then, then, then you need different strategies. And one of the ways it's done is to break down the bigger processes into smaller steps, quite obviously, and have them linked. And when one is finished, it triggers the next one and so on. 